Anyone? Yes, my name is Finn Sprague. I live on Charles Jordan Road, Cape Elizabeth. And I've just recently received a copy of the proposed ordinance. Um, I live in a part of Cape Elizabeth that the population density problem is basically the deer. Um, after reading this ordinance, I come to the conclusion that a lot of people who own property not in our sector necessarily are going to be hurt by it. Uh, when I was on the uh, sewer committee, where we had to study the problems in Cape Elizabeth by, caused by the population density in some of the areas, it was pretty obvious that some of the uh, plans in the Cape has been to uh, the anti-growth. Um, I feel that this ordinance has uh, really uh, been put in as a backwards way of, of shutting down a lot of the growth in Cape Elizabeth. And although I too would like Cape Elizabeth to always be the same uh, as it was when I first remember it, um, I have to recognize that there is going to be change. Uh, uh, Mr. Taylor was up here talking from the perspective of a person who was trying to build single family units in Cape Elizabeth. And I guess I'm coming at this from someone who doesn't have that problem, but is concerned about how we are going to continue to uh, uh, maintain some autonomy over the property that we live on. Uh, it's not clear to me from this ordinance uh, what's wrong with cutting timber uh, and proper forest management programs. Uh, a lot of the areas that have been uh, identified that have, are near me uh, uh, are covered in our tree farming areas. And we have state approved forest management programs on, these, on this property. And from what I am, have heard tonight previously, and uh, there apparently is something wrong with cutting trees. Uh, diseased, dead trees, d trees that have uh, reached their maturity and should be harvested. That's what happens on a rural area such as we live in. But apparently, according to this ordinance, that's, it's not appropriate. I, I wonder what would happen to this uh, particular area if it's not managed. I think management should be considered. I don't think it's appropriate on any forested piece of <coughs> property to not manage it and manage it appropriately. Um, I also noticed that agricultural uses lose their grandfathering after a year. Um, it's standard agricultural practice to leave prop, uh, fields fallow. You may leave them fallow for a number of years. Now these fields uh, lost their uh, status for agriculture. Do we want to change the map of Cape Elizabeth that much? The character of the Cape Elizabeth? A lot of these, um, we're talking about 250 feet back from a line that we really haven't established very well. I mean, you could be a, a thousand or more feet back. Um, every 200 feet is an acre, over an acre of running distance. And if you look at the map of Cape Elizabeth and use that criteria, you've got a considerable uh, amount of Cape Elizabeth that is being taken out of even the agricultural and tree farming aspect. This is a major change to the map of Cape Elizabeth, and I'd, I'd like it to be considered. Um, um, how is the town going to enforce a no motorized vehicle on some of the larger tracts of land. How are they going to enforce my cutting of firewood on a, on a, a swamp maple stand where I go in and cut the dead wood? I don't want to be again in front of the town council because I've done something wrong. I think it's appropriate to consider these things and consider the fact that there are many different uh, uh, communities within the Cape and some things are, are appropriate and some things are not. So I'm, I'm going to encourage the town council to 
um, uh, put, take this ordinance and, and ask that the that it be reviewed uh, from a practical standpoint on some of the larger um, parcels, and also what it is going to do in terms of the the people that have been in the Cape for generations and have managed to keep their properties intact and are looking at their next generation and what they're going to do and how those people are going to find affordable places to live. And if you cut out the buildable lots in Cape Elizabeth, all you're going to do is raise the cost of the other lots. And it, I don't think it's fair. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. What you had to say. They've heard it before about cutting trees. Anybody else? Yes, sir. My name is Edward Perry. I live on 10 Pine Ridge Road. I hadn't planned to say anything tonight since my understanding was that we really weren't going to be speaking. However, uh, I look at this from a different perspective than the two previous speakers as a person living in a very overcrowded portion of Cape Elizabeth. Uh, I see this as uh, one way to preserve open space that uh, I think we need. I think that we have to look uh, back to our comprehensive plan survey that uh, came in a year or so ago where it was revealed that by the public's request that the one number one goal in the whole town was to preserve open space. And it sounds tonight from the two previous speakers that, you know, the wetlands ordinance does have uh, problems with it. Um, we've been, we've talked with lawyers about the ordinance and uh, our understanding is the ordinance can be amended at any time. That uh, if there are problems with uh, timber cutting and uh, agriculture that uh, are unfair to people, th those portions of the ordinance can be amended. But I think that the spirit of the ordinance is important. And as we continue to stall, not stall, but uh, take longer and longer to put in the ordinance, there's less and less wetlands left. Uh, I think simply by looking at the planning board agenda, uh, we can see that that's happening. And I hope that uh, the town council will continue uh, to expedite the ordinance as they stated they would and as they seem to have been doing. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Yes, sir. My name is Tim Thompson, and I live on Pine Ridge Road also. I, too, had not planned on speaking tonight, but having listened to the first couple of speakers, it's, it's interesting. They both approach it from two different uh, angles, both having problems with it, uh, but maybe from completely different, uh, for completely different reasons. I think uh, some of the points that are the first uh, fellow had uh, may be some of the best evidence as to why we should have this wetlands ordinance in. Maybe some of those lots that were built on shouldn't have been built on. And you don't have to look too far around the Cape uh, to see a lot, building lots that were filled in. Ponds that had uh, previously uh, all kinds of wildlife uh, utilization, having, now having a, a single unit residential house on them. I think those are some of the very best reasons why we are, as a town, taking the time with our conservation commission with our planning board, with all the resources that we have are, are, uh, in, in front of us, and we put together what I think is a very fine ordinance. Maybe it's got a few points that need to be ironed out. Certainly a fellow uh, that's got a large tract of land uh, with concerns about whether or not he can ch uh, cut up dead wood on his property, I think maybe that might be a little bit restrictive. But I agree with Mr. Perry that the spirit of this is we want to conserve the quality of the lifestyle that we've got here in the Cape. 
And this is, this is an ordinance that's not going to say we're anti-development. We're going to say that we want quality development. Uh, quality development in, uh, goes along with all the other qualities that we have in our Cape. Um, build on property that's buildable. Don't fill in wetlands to build roads. Uh, we've seen it around the Cape where we're supposed to have a 5,000 yard uh, fill in order to build on. Well, that happens and then pretty soon the yard gets filled in and the backyard gets filled in and, and before you know it, certainly more than 5,000 yards. And how do you enforce that? Uh, I think the buffers are something. Uh, Ms. Latore in, in uh, the, the last town council mentioned that how much difference, is, difference was there between the old wetlands ordinance and the new wetlands ordinance. I think if you compared some of the current uh, plan uh, developments that are under consideration and you looked at them and you compared what the number of developable lots that are going to be capable under the old one as compared to the new one, uh, there's like half the number of lots would be uh, available under the, the new ordinance as compared to the old ordinance. I think that's that's quite a, uh, a difference uh, between it and what we're looking at now. Uh, the only other comment that I would like to make tonight is uh, we're going to have two uh, public <coughs> hearings in January, and I'm sure that's going to be quite spirited and probably the best example I can think of how, why this form of government works so well. But uh, what I would like to request is that maybe at the end of those, if it's all out in the, the little nits and gnats of the ordinance have been worked out uh, that as opposed to delaying that another 30 days for enactment at the end of the second public hearing I'd like to request for your consideration maybe we could enact it immediately thank, thank you, you for your time thank you anybody else if not how much time are you going to take 30 seconds. okay quick <laughs> I just wish to point out that, at least insofar as our subdivisions are concerned, any wetlands impact has been reviewed by the Town Planning Board, the Town Conservation Commission, the Maine Department of Environmental Protection, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, and has been conducted properly, and that of the 31 lots that I discussed earlier that are affected, um, we are talking about upland areas that are already buffered from wetlands that would now be rendered unbuildable. Thank you. Thank you. So therefore, with nobody else, we will move on to item 79, to consider a report from the Ordinance Committee regarding the proposed wetland ordinance taking necessary action. Do I hear a motion? Yes, Councilor Cargashaw. I move that we refer this present draft of the wetlands ordinance back to the Ordinance Committee to have a final draft prepared for a public hearing, the first of two public hearings on January 8th, 1990. Second. <clears throat> Been moved and seconded. Did you want a 7.30 p.m. at the town oh, hall? 7.30 p.m. at the town hall. Yes. Thank you. Everyone understand the motion? All in favor, raise your hand. Those opposed? Seven to nothing. Mr. Chairman. Yes, might I just make one point, and that is uh, it's always uh, delightful to see so much input uh, at the council meetings as well as public hearings. Uh, if it is at all possible for any and all concerned to send in their written comments, uh, it would be very helpful to the Ordinance Committee to have these um, as early as possible to, in a reflective and well thought out fashion, try to address them before the uh, public hearing. Thank you. Item 80. Consider a report from the Ordinance Committee regarding the proposed amendment to the dog ordinance to take any necessary action. Council Kramer. Give me just a moment here, Mr. Chairman, to get my wetlands out of the way and my dogs in front of me here. They barking? More than barking. <laughs> well, as uh, many may have remembered uh, from past meetings with respect to um, making some changes in the uh, current uh, dog ordinance, uh, we have taken the uh, recommendations, which really have been uh, many. Um, we have received um, 
very formal input from the Fort Williams Advisory uh, Commission. Uh, without going into the whole memo, uh, generally speaking, the uh, majority of the commission were in support for more freedom for dog owners in the park than the proposed ordinance uh, would have allowed. As you recall, the proposed ordinance had not uh, allowed dogs to be off of a leash in uh, Fort Williams Park. There were uh, several letters that I received uh, suggesting a variety of uh, uh, different aspects to the ordinance, setting certain uh, times of the day for exercising dogs unleashed. Um, this we didn't feel was feasible. Um, considering cemeteries as a groomed area, we did think this was feasible and have included it in the current proposed draft. Um, generally speaking, there were no new um, issues that had come in over the last month since we had addressed this uh, during public hearing uh, in the past. So that what I would like to do this evening, essentially, is to not go through the entire ordinance, but really only to highlight one particular section, uh, that being section 717, recognizing that we will again place the, uh, the proposed uh, dog ordinance draft uh, for a public hearing on January 8th. Section 71-7 hopefully will respond to many of the citizens who presented uh, their opinion at the last public hearing, uh, indicating that there was a need, especially with regard to exercising large dogs, to have an area uh, in Fort Williams where dogs could be uh, exercised off leash uh, or tether, such that Section 717 will read as follows in the proposed draft. Any dog within the boundaries of a groomed and or regularly maintained municipal property including, but not limited to, Fort Williams Park, municipal cemeteries, public roads, municipal sidewalks, and athletic fields will be walked on a leash or tether at all times. The person accompanying the dog in these situations is required to collect any feces dropped by the animal and dispose of same in an area where it will not likely be encountered by any person. And this is the new section since the last public hearing in this evening. The Cape Elizabeth Poor Farm, Lions Field, excluding the Little League Field, and a 20-plus acre portion of Fort Williams Park, southerly of Humphreys Road, that being the road fronting the park's maintenance building and extending along a line to the rear of the long garages at the rear of officers' row buildings, but excluding the fields immediately south of Portland Headlight and in front of Battery Blair. These areas would not be considered to be groomed and or regularly maintained for the purposes of this ordinance. So in essence, we would be providing to the citizenry, uh, in particular in Fort Williams Park, a roughly 20 to 22 acre uh, area of land for the uh, exercising of uh, large, medium, or small dogs uh, off tether uh, or leash to um, hopefully satisfy the concerns of uh, several citizens who were uh, most concerned that the proposed uh, ordinance be too restrictive. That's the major change, uh, Mr. Chairman. As I say, I'm very happy to take any further uh, comment uh, from citizens uh, with the intention, hopefully, of, again, setting a second um, public hearing for January 8th with regard to the uh, changes in the dog ordinance. Thank you. Has anybody got any questions to the Councilor Kramer? No, but I, I had a request of the town manager, <laughs> which, sure. which he's roaming here somewhere. We asked you to make coffee, too. Um, coffee? Could you, <laughs> Michael, could you get me and the other councilors at some point a map of the exact area, you know, there must be a Fort Williams map somewhere <laughs> of the area. I think one's being provided. With a red line around where this proposed area would be. I, I, I really need one. You can blacken that out for Council Latore. So you, can read, that, you that, can read from the description. It forms a basic crescent on that uh, map. It's yellow, so is it acceptable? The yellow okay. is the boundary. I, I'd like a copy of that if I could. Thank you, sir. 
Anybody else? He's so good with the copy machine. <laughs> Why we hire him? Do I hear a motion? Mr. Chairman, I'll, I'll move that we set uh, <laughs> this ordinance for public hearing on uh, January 8th at 7.30 town at hall. the town hall. Second. Thank you. It's been moved and seconded. Anybody else stand up? I'd Excuse like to me. congratulate the ordinance committee on uh, taking seriously uh, uh, the input that they received from the public and from the council and doing an excellent job, I think. Thank you. Addressing those issues that were raised. Everyone understand the motion? All in favor, raise your hand. Those opposed? It's a vote, seven to nothing. What I'd like to do at this point is take a five minute break and you people at home can stretch your legs and what have you and we'll be back in five minutes. Thank you. And we have an item on the agenda here, item 81, to consider a request from the uh, wet team to raise funds for the purchase of a rescue raft and take any necessary action. And I believe we have the police chief here, which is ahead of the wet team, going to give us a presentation on rescue water related. Basically, what we're proposing by this request is to be allowed to uh, embark on a selective solicitation of uh, a few individuals, some companies, marine-related industry, etc., to provide us monies to purchase a, a, a six-meter rescue craft, a rigid hull inflatable, as it's called. To give you a little bit of the history as to why we've arrived at this point. When we first formed the wet team about a year ago, we had donated to us by uh, a resident of the Cape a 10-foot raft, which was very serviceable and uh, you know held up very well for us. In through our training though this summer, we discovered that it had some severe limitations, particularly uh, any distance out at sea. We trained on the boat that came aground uh, off Richmond Island uh, a couple of times, and it was very evident that that the 10-foot boat simply wasn't big enough. Uh, matter of fact, it was dangerous trying to board the uh, uh, grounded craft on that vessel. We have tried since uh, about March to find some surplus vessel that would fit our needs and we have in fact located a couple of those generally in government storage and I can tell you standing here tonight that boating will go out of fashion before we can get one of those boats. <laughs> uh, <laughs> To give you a little rundown as to how government bureaucracy works with these things, uh, this particular vessel we found in Brunswick was mothballed by a governmental entity. It was serviceable after we, you know, could have put some money into it and repaired it. But we were told that first dibs go to DOD, Department of Defense. They have several months with which to decide whether they want that vessel or not. After that, uh, the General Accounting Office takes over. And the General Accounting Office is the repository for all federal law enforcement agencies. Uh, Secret Service, the FBI, Drug Enforcement, Customs, you name it, and they have a shot at it. If they don't want it, it then cycles down to state agencies, state police, Marine Patrol, et cetera, et cetera. And all of these entities have several months to take a look at it. So we were looking at around 1991, 1992, before the municipal pecking order came up. So we got a little discouraged by that. And we had called a number of people uh, through Main Street 90 organization. Uh, I talked personally with the Commissioner of Public Safety, John Atwood, and they were all very gracious in attempting to help us, but there's just no cutting through that bureaucratic red tape. 
So as a practical matter, we would never get this boat, you know, uh, by the time we got it, it would be like gray jelly sitting on the dock down there. It's, it's too bad to see that that material is rotting away. This seemed to be the most logical method that we could pursue to purchase a boat. Uh, when I was in Louisville last fall, I talked with uh, a couple of representatives of some major boat dealers who have allowed municipalities to buy their surplus property, and I shouldn't use that term, I, I would say that demonstrators, ones that they've taken around the country and shown uh, at considerable savings. Of course, we, do, we would fall into government pricing. Uh, to purchase this boat and all the accoutrements that go with it, uh, electronics, outboard, et cetera, we feel we're going to need around $30,000. We have been approached by a number of people who uh, have an interest in the wet team uh, and would like to donate monies, but of course by town charter, it has to uh, be approved by the town council for us to accept these funds. Uh, and that's why we're here tonight to get that, uh, to get that permission. We do not intend to hold any kind of a general fundraiser. We're very much aware that uh, the town is embarking on fundraising efforts of its own. Of its own. We just want to be able to uh, accept those funds that uh, people have approached us about. Thank you. Very good. And in your memo, it was, was outlined very good as far as what you tried to do and what you need. And I would I'm add sure. Also, uh, and I think it's probably important to mention this that uh, because of the uniqueness of this team, as, and we did win an award last year, as you remember. Uh, we have been written up in National Fisherman Magazine, which by its name is a national publication. Hasn't even gone on the newsstands yet, and we've got about seven requests for a paper on how we formed the wet team. Uh, the graciousness of the council and the initial sponsoring of that is mentioned throughout, I can assure you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, in, in how can we turn you down? Are there names <laughs> mentioned, or, or is it just general? Well, we're on the final <laughs> edit, so <laughs> it's impossible. <laughs> You've Did heard the uh, <laughs> speech from the police chief. Anybody got any questions to the chief? Council Amaral. Yeah, uh, you're proposing that you raise 15000 uh through making contacts of people donating money, and that uh, you're planning to put 15000 in your request for fiscal year 91. That's correct. If we could get complete offsetting revenues from the solicitation, then... Then you, you won't know. need to. Now, yeah. what if you do raise the 15000 and the 15000 in the town budget does not survive uh, budget deliberations? What happens? We'll wait till next year or attempt another fundraiser at another time. Thank you. Council Cogshaw. Who, who are the people who, are they private individuals who have made promises of donations? Are you going to businesses? Or how are you? Primarily, they have been private individual as well as marine-related businesses. That have, have approached you with yes. donations. Mm -hmm. Has the publication of our wish list brought in any other interest? That, that has been generally published. Uh, I understand that there's going to be a number of follow-up articles. Matter of fact, I was asked the other day to write an article about that, and I would certainly, you know, propose that. I, I would still do that. Yes, we were uh, hoping for the whole thing. Yeah, <coughs> yeah. It would, At least it would the boat be nice. and trailer. Yeah. That would save us a lot of a lot of time too if someone did that. Thank you. Anybody else? Council Greenlaw. Chief Pickering, how many individuals and businesses are we talking about for this solicitation? I don't know the exact number as far as the amount of people that, number one, have approached us and, and the amount of people that we feel uh, might deserve a phone call and ask if they wanted to participate in the program. Uh, couldn't give you a number, but I would say certainly under 50. Okay. And I'm curious why you took your break at 15000 for fundraising and 15000 in your budget instead of... 20,000 for fundraising and 10,000 in your budget. 15,000 have been proposed by uh, another department head and in discussing discussions with that department head and, and the manager uh, we would like to incorporate those monies under my budget for the wet team and the $15,000 figure was just uh, a mention for more or less a utility boat which we would incorporate into this vessel use it for, for, uh, for those purposes. Well, I would tend to encourage you to raise your expectations of your fundraising. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, Councilor Masses, who is uh, actually going to do the the fundraising? You're precluded from doing it, right? Right. Uh, members of the team. Yes, be, t be two members of uh, the steering committee. Thank you. Anybody else? Comments? Questions? I, I Councilor Latour. I just commend the chief for, for finding this company and for digging up a demonstrator model and going a very very frugal route. 
You're certainly in line with administrators as we head into the 90s of needing to save every dime. And you've, you've done a good job, seriously. You've really pursued this. And, and uh, as opposed to just coming in saying, I want the Cadillac, let's go with it. You found a way to, to keep the cost down. I, thank you. Appreciate that. Councilor Greenlaw. I do want to commend you for the article in that magazine. It had been brought to my attention by Dick Kinsman a couple of weekends ago, I think, and I was delighted it was in the council packets, and I encourage the other councils to well, read it. It's very good press. It's not Esquire, but as they say, it is good press. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else? Do I hear a motion? I move that we authorize the water extrication team to raise funds for the purchase of a rescue raft. Do I hear a second? Second. second. Any other comment? Anybody? You all understand the motion? If so, raise your hand. Those opposed? If we understand it or if we're voting <laughs> yeah. for it. Oh, we got him. You, are, you should understand picky, the motion. Picky, picky. <laughs> Thank you. Item 82. Now we're going to whiz right down through here. Let's whiz. Whiz. Going to move fast. To consider the acceptance of a drainage easement and right away from Gary A. Punsky on the property off of State Avenue and take any necessary action. The manager, please. Yes, uh, State Avenue is, is a dead end road. Uh, it, 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 at its end, it actually goes up and around in a circle, but then there's a little dead end portion. This, this is within the dead end portion. Mr. Punsky approached the planning board about uh, back in 1987, almost two years ago now, and was granted a public access waiver based upon two conditions. One is that he grant a drainage easement to the town, and the second is that he grant an easement providing that at some point perhaps a connector road I uh, could go through there. He recently followed through uh, looking for a building permit uh, on the particular lot and uh, actually went ahead and filed the deed granting the town uh, these two rights in the registry uh, when we discovered it and uh, suggested that uh, it did have to be approved by the town council uh, before it uh, was supposed to have been filed. So Thank I would you. encourage you to, uh, to approve it. Council Cargishow. Yes, I'm not very clear on the letter we received from my town attorney. He makes references to items B and C and then A and D, and I find nothing in the documents. We were presented that a letter to numbered that way. So maybe you could just clarify a little more what his letter is trying to tell us. Yes, some of them, first, what he's referring to are conditions of the planning board approval. Uh, some of the conditions related to the construction of uh, it has to be paved for so many feet off the existing pavement. The standard procedures are in the public access waiver. In addition to that, there were two requirements, which are either C and D or A and B, and I don't know which of the four they are. I don't have the document in front of me, uh, which are the fact that this easement had to be granted for the connector road and uh, secondly for the drainage easement. But the other, the, other, the other letters were parts of a number of other conditions that are standard for public access waivers and are handled. Uh, by the by, the code enforcement officer, the director of public works. So, are these things included, as he says, either in the deed, or has he obtained a building permit as yet? Uh, not. He he has obtained a building permit, uh, but the occupancy <coughs> permit is subject to approval of this and uh, the completion of the other conditions. And has that been conditioned, as he suggested? Yes, it has been. Okay. Thank you, Council Greenlaw. I'm curious as to. What stormwater is drained through this drainage easement? Is it stormwater off of public road? Yes, in part as well as general neighborhood water. Would you classify it all as being public stormwater as opposed to private? I, I usually try to avoid those classifications. <laughs> <laughs> is it different? My concern is with maintenance just oh. because I've run into that yeah. in other capacities. I so I think you understand then why I answered the question the way I did. I thought water was water. Water is water. Well, you all, all set? No, I'm not. Okay, I'm sure. Babbling. My concern is that if it's private, if it's water from private properties and that there would be a clear understanding who is responsible for maintenance within the drainage easement. Yeah. Is that clear in your mind? Yes, it is clear. And it would be essentially, it'd be essentially the town responsibility. 
because uh, it does in fact cover water in part coming off the road and uh, we are customarily responsible for those. Thank you. And some of that water that comes off the road may have come off a private property before it got to the road. Exactly, exactly. I don't intend to trace. Thank you. Council Matheson. What connector road? There, uh, there is no plan for a connector road at this point. Uh, it was, it was a condition the planning board had, uh, for whatever reason, I'm not too sure, because uh, you do have Trout Brook, excuse me, very close to this area. And you do have a field right handy to this that someday something could happen, which would be a connector road to it. Yeah, it could eventually loop, I suppose, up right. uh, onto Sawyer across some of Maxwell's field. But, yeah. there, but I don't want to scare anyone. There are no current plans for that. And, this was looked at at the planning board in 87 as, I think, sound planning to look at the long-range possibilities. Okay. Any, anybody else? Council Cleveland. Well, Mr. Chairman, I was going to move acceptance of Mr. Punsky's uh, drainage easement and right-of-way. Thank you. Been moved and taken. All in favor, raise your hand. Those opposed? Those opposed. Seven to nothing. Item 83, to consider a proposed general assistance ordinance and taking necessary action. The manager, please. Yeah, every two years or so, we, or year to two, in fact, we receive a proposed general assistance ordinance through the Maine Municipal Association. It does need to be approved by the municipal offices, which in our case is the legislative body and the town council. Uh, and I would encourage you to set this for a public hearing on uh, January 22nd, 1990. So moved. Second. All in favor, raise your hand. Those opposed, vote seven or nothing. Item 84, to consider the approval of an emergency ordinance to prevent mobile home park as required by state statute and take any necessary action. We have a mobile home park emergency ordinance before us, which we haven't had for a very long time. And uh, I would like to hear some comments from the council what their wishes. Mr. Chairman. Council Latori. In, in light of the fact that I think that we need further time to scrutinize the specifics of the emergency ordinance that is before us, I would like to uh, table this item until our January 8th meeting, 1990. Second. second. Been moved and seconded. Any other comments? Do you understand the motion? All in favor say aye. Those opposed? Let's vote. Seven and nine. You guys aren't on the ball. Uh, item 85, to consider the appointments of the building inspector, plumbing inspector, electrical inspector, deputy health officer, code enforcement officer, town assessor, tree warden for 1990 and taking necessary action. I will turn that over to the manager. Yeah, I would recommend the appointment of Gerald E. Daigle as town assessor, uh, Gerald E. Daigle as building inspector, Ernest W. McVeigh as code enforcement officer, Gerald Daigle and Ernest W. McVeigh as plumbing inspectors, electrical inspectors, and deputy health officers, and Richard Churchill as tree warden. Second. So moved. We moved and seconded. <laughs> there's, there's, backwards. That backwards? there's your backwards democracy Boy, that, that you were looking backwards. for. I, I thought Michael moved it. I'm sorry. He, just, <laughs> no, he, he, he hasn't even run yet. So moved. I wasn't paying attention. And second. And second. <laughs> Once, <laughs> twice, three times. Anybody got any comments? You all understand the motion? Raise your hand. Yeah, Those opposed? It's a vote. Jeez, you keep doing that. that. Okay. Oh. Item 86, to consider the amending the charges of the War Veterans Recognition Committee and taking necessary action. I believe in your packet you'll see a little memo of uh, changing the charges of the War Veterans Memorial Committee. The reason we had our first meeting on December 5th and in discussing it with the committee, we feel the time schedule that we had before them was a little too short, so I took it upon myself and their recommendation was that we come up with new dates of April 1st, 1990 for their preliminary report and July 1st, 1990 for their final report or before. So what is your wishes? So moved. Second. Second. Been moved and seconded. 
that we extend the reports from the War Veterans Memorial Committee from February 1st to April 1st, 1990, and May 1st to July 1st, 1990. All in favor, raise your hand. Those opposed? I think I got him guessing. Get him shaking his head. <laughs> Item 87, to consider setting a public hearing on an unsafe structure at One Spring Avenue and taking necessary action. I believe the manager's going to brief you on that one. This is a building that is right on the South Portland Cape Elizabeth line uh, on Spring Avenue. It recently uh, suffered a fire, uh, and it is the belief of the building inspector that it is unsafe at this time. We have made attempts to, uh, to notify the current owner and, and the prospective owner. Uh, the building has been ordered sold from the current owner to the prospective owner by the courts uh, due to some, some sort of a property dispute. Uh, and uh, you know, meanwhile, the, the building remains unsafe and no one has addressed it. Uh, so I'd ask that you would set a public hearing uh, on this item uh, for January 22nd and we will attempt to notify all the various parties uh, who, who may or may not have an interest in this property. It's, it's difficult because there are tenths of interest and uh, it, uh, it, it really is, is a, it's a maze to figure out the ownership of the property, but we'll attempt to notify everyone. Councilor Greenlaw. I have a question through the chair to the manager. Do we have a projected cost for the demolition of this structure? No, we do not. It, it would not be substantial. It's, uh, at this point, it's uh, some foundation walls and cleanup primarily. And I believe most of the work could be accomplished by the Department of Public Works. Thank you. Council Cargoshaw. I was going to move that we set for public hearing on January 22nd at 7.30, the um, public hearing on the unsafe structure at One Spur Wink Avenue. Second. Been moved and seconded. Everybody understand the motion? If so, raise your hand. Those opposed? It's a vote, seven to nothing. Item 88, to consider the proposed amendment to the town ways ordinance regarding a, the backfilling of trenches and taking necessary action. I believe the manager has this one. Yeah, Bob Malley, our director of public works, has suggested that we, we have a deadline for filling in of trenches with bituminous concrete. Uh, after it's been backfilled so that uh, we, we don't have unsafe roads. And he has recommended uh, within 24 hours uh, after the trench has been backfilled that uh, bituminous concrete be placed on it. And I would encourage you to uh, refer this to the Ordinance Committee for review. Before it goes to the Ordinance Committee for review, I would just like to point out, and I pointed it out to the manager, he's got 24 hours after the trench has been backfilled. The trench could be backfilled on Saturday morning or Friday, and uh, would they have to come back and do it Sunday? I think this should be reviewed and use working days or working something days. to that effect, uh, 48 hours or something, because it would create a Sunday or a Saturday afternoon type. Already right, holiday. Already right, holiday, that is correct. So what is your wishes? Chairman, I'll move that this item be sent to the Ordinance Committee. Second. Been moved and seconded that item 88 go to the Ordinance Committee. All those in favor, raise a hand. Those opposed, it's a vote. Item 89, to consider report from the town manager on town-owned lots and take any necessary action. Michael. What is your wishes? This is a report you requested, and I will avoid going through each and every lot, but uh, I did want you to be aware of the lots that our town owned and the restrictions that apply to them. Mr. Chairman? Go ahead, sir. I move acknowledging receipt of said report. I'll second. Been moved and seconded. Thank you, Michael, for the report. Yes, Excellent. thank you. Excellent. a lot of time. I think I asked for it. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. I hope they all read it. Uh, to under, the under the Carter administration, wasn't it? <laughs> you all understand the motion? We do. All those <laughs> in favor, raise your hand. <laughs> those opposed? He'll get tested later, I know. Oh, you deserve it. Item 90, to consider the proposed budget impact schedule for the fiscal year 1991 to 1995 and take any necessary action. <clears throat> Michael. 
I would call your attention to page uh, 13. I think it's the, the most significant page in this particular document. Uh, that as well as uh, page 16. Uh, page 16 might even be more appropriate because that, that gives the percentage as well as the numbers. And what this shows is uh, for the next five or six years with all of the projected municipal needs, our tax rate for municipal services uh, should be very close to the cost of living adjustments. Uh, it ranges from a 2.2 percent increase to 6.7, 4.1, 3.2, 3.7, and then 7.1 in 19, uh, fiscally in 1995. The problem is when you add in the county budget. Uh, the county budget has been submitted to the county budget advisory committee of which our council chairman serves as the chairman. That's correct. And that budget contains uh, a 55 percent increase in the county tax assessment, which for Cape Elizabeth would transfer into about a 60 percent increase in the county tax because our valuation up a little bit more than other communities. In addition to that, with the recent approval of the county jail, uh, some of the bond amount is, is supposed to be paid next year. With those two factors, our county tax would go up 81.8 percent next year. Uh, that would therefore bring a, a 6.7 percent increase in town taxation, which you know you'd probably whittle down some during the budget process. You add that to the county increase, and the way with the, the numbers are weighted, that would total an average, that would total a tax increase excluding schools of 15.5 percent. So you can see the, the tremendous impact that the county has on municipal services. Uh, and you know, it's it, even in the following year, when because of again the, the jail referendum, uh, the the county taxes do go up at least 15 percent. Uh, so you know, I think it's a it's a overall it's a very ambitious program, and department heads uh, did a very good job putting forward the needs. And uh, I would ask that you acknowledge receipt of this report, uh, which did take a considerable amount of time, and uh, it's something that's done every year, and I find very interesting to do so. I would encourage you to acknowledge receipt of it. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Councilor Tory. Yes, Michael, the 81% increase as it's proposed right now, you said was made up of what? Did you mention two major factors? Yes. One, the jail being one and? And the county budget in, in and of itself. Yeah. I, I just want to point out to our, our chairman, who's also chairman of that committee, how thoroughly unacceptable that figure is to many of us. And I understand the restrictions of the fact that uh, that there was a vote that, that took place, so some mandates have to proceed, but I hope that other areas of cuts can be found such that that is not our final figure that comes in. And I also just want to point out to members of the audience that are here and people at home specifically that these are just projections. The 15.5 percent increase which is listed here is, just, is A number one, just to underline what Michael said, just for the municipal side. And number two, it is nothing that is a goal of ours or that is a fait accompli, cast in cement, or something that we're saying, announcing right now, next year's budget's going up 15 percent. These are all just projections. If we do our job, we'll be able to whittle that down significantly, and hopefully, hopefully we can. So sometimes uh, these numbers are grabbed and made into uh, stories when, when they're not completely understood. And I just wanted to clarify for the people at home what this 15.5 that's written here on this paper in front of me represents. It is not something we're endorsing, saying is going to happen, or has, a, has as our goal. Councilor Masterson. Um, Mr. Chairman, um, as chairman of that Budget Advisory Committee, do you think that the process is working? No. Nope. You really have no power, do you? We have you, no power. You're just advisory. Just advisory. And Could, did you make, were you able to make any cuts on the county budget? Uh, the county budget come in as a 55 percent increase, and we went through the budget as the best we could. And there's a lot of comment on not being in on the process of meeting with the department heads and what have you. And so we have made some recommendations. Last year, the county budget come in as 24 percent. We have recommended that they whittle that from 55 percent down to 30 percent increase, which is two and a half million dollars out of that budget. This and year? This year. This year. <clears throat> so that would be a six percent increase over last year. Now that is only a recommendation. The county commissioners can uh, take some of that and do something with it, or they can ignore it all and put it through and there's nothing we can do. But trying to set up a meeting with the common county delegation to express our concerns of the power that this committee has and what can be done 
as far as some of those elective offices that just come in there and do a very little and have to hire somebody to do the work within the courthouse and kind of makes a double figure as far as salaries go. Some of those mm -hmm. elected officials, salaries aren't that large, but the, one of them, the treasurer, signs the checks, and that's it. Somebody else runs the office. Well, you may so, remember, Mr. Chairman, a few years ago, we had a referendum on a new county charter that would have appointed those department heads had the commissioners appoint them and would have done away with an extra person in each department. We're trying that again. And I don't know Good. whether we'll proceed or not, and we hope we can do it. And that's one way we feel we can get the county budget down to some reasonable <coughs> working uh, entity because there's so many things within that budget that's unbelievable that is state mandated that we don't have no control over. There was $500,000 in that budget <coughs> this year for due to the county jail was so overcrowded that each day that the administrator had to call every jail in the state of Maine to see if they had a bed available and then they had to transport the overload to those facilities. And we have recommended that they reduce that somewhat because they're having a temporary jail being built, ten temporary sales cells similar to these temporary uh, build different uh, school classrooms they're putting up on uh, right beside the present jail. So we felt that they could reduce that. And uh, cost, the state is charging the county now to put uh, inmates at uh, South Wyndham has gone up tremendously too, which in the past was pretty much bad by the state. So there's, some of this is fed back from the state to county government to come up with. So it, it's a pretty big, hard process to go through to deal with it. Councilor Amaro. Yeah, I just, it, it really points out the need for some property tax reform and relief. And uh, there were several bills introduced in the last legislative session that would have removed several of the responsibilities of county government from being supported by local property taxes. And uh, Turned those operations over to the state. And jails was one. Jails was one. Uh, the court systems was another. And I mean, real. It, it just uh, to have uh, an increase uh, of that size on uh, the put back on our local property tax payers just totally ties our hands. Is what we can do. What we can do next year as a community. Uh, and it's it's just really inappropriate. I think that. We've really got to work hard this year on the whole property tax reform issue. I don't mean to put you on the grill, but I just have one final question. When you made your recommendation to cut the 55% increase to 30, did you also at the same time make some recommendation for cuts? We, as I told two of the new members on that committee, and they got quite a joke out of it because they, uh, said, I don't understand this, I don't understand that. I said, that's just like when you get the school budget in your hometown and you don't understand half of that. And they all shook their head and says, right. But we did. We Next. recommendations on where they could make some cuts. And it's just strictly recommendations. And, and uh, that's all it is, just a recommendation. They, and take it or leave it. So the budget is not finalized yet? Not as far as the county commissioners are concerned, no. They're due to have a hearing here in, I think before the end of the year. You got a notice? I they no notify every community. Didn't get a notice yet. They notify every community, so. Christmas Eve. Probably. Well, if all the town councils and selectmen showed up and in force, at that hearing, maybe it'll be we'd voted, be It'll heard. be voted on between now and Christmas. That's that's the two years that's I right. was on the budget advisory. It's always between now and Christmas. I don't know just what the date is. So the is, vote right? isn't done yet. Yeah. It, and uh, one other comment. It, one of the sheets here, it indicates that four out of the last five years, the tax rate for municipal services uh, increased less than two-tenths of one percent. One year it was 0 0.1 percent, another year 0 percent, another year 0 0.1, another year 0 0.2. Uh, 
you know, my con I have a concern that we're constantly being added to take on more and more responsibility in terms of uh, the council's priority of land acquisition, as well as particularly in the area of solid waste. Uh, next year, there's there's an additional twenty five thousand dollars set aside for uh, a demolition disposal expense. Uh, the regional waste uh, tipping fee is projected to go up at least ten thousand dollars, and you know it's going to be impossible. Uh, you know, I think to continue at the, the zero percent level, and uh, you know, I think you really ought to be looking at a, at a municipal side uh, increase uh, to keep up with inflation at approximately 4.5 percent. And I think it'd be extremely unfortunate if you if you let the municipal government and the municipal services fall uh, further behind uh, by making the municipal services absorb the total burden of the county expense. Uh, I think when you look at the municipal budget, when you, we were looking at salaries earlier, uh, and some of the other issues is, you know, we, we're in the average for the re region. We're not at, at the top on the municipal side. And, uh, you know, I would hope that as you review the budget uh, this coming year, you would consider that and uh, find the balance uh, between all the various budgets and uh, uh, determine the, the priorities as, as best you know how. Thank you. I would just like <clears throat> to add a little something as far as the budget goes, and this is this regional waste and this tipping fees. These communities where these uh, facilities are uh, placed, I think, are taking a big advantage of these small communities, and especially Gorham, of what they're getting out of having that uh, have waste area there on the Ross Grant site. I don't know if any of you kept up with the uh, cost of added to the tipping fees of what Gorham is getting. Did any of you figure this? 325000 then $100,000 a year. They got, and plus they're going to make an athletic field for them. And this is, you're paying for all of this. And this is an annual fee of $100,000 to the town of Gorham just to have that site. And they didn't own the site. It was privately owned. But this was an agreement. Now, I didn't realize until a little while ago, City of Portland, City of South Portland, they get a, a fee every year, <coughs> so much per ton for the regional waste burner and the where they bail in the City of Portland and South Portland each year. And I don't know whether this is time to speak to some legislators and maybe they should be controlled like your telephone and power company under the PUC. Somebody's got to do it because there's a certain communities there are railroading the rest of it through. And this may be harsh language to some people, but it's down to earth and straightforward. That is what's happening. I can I got the article on what Gorham is getting out of having that site in Gorham. And there's a counselor from Gorham said everybody was a winner. The only winner was Gorham, in my opinion. And this is why some of these fees are going up. And recycling and these salvageable materials, you have no place to sell them. You have no, nothing to do with them. So everybody's taking them off somewhere and charging you to, to haul them away. And I think this deal's got to get turned around or it's going to cost you big, big bucks in the future if they don't start finding areas to uh, put these materials and really put them to use. This all goes along with the budget. Right? Evolve. What's your wishes? To acknowledge, I move that we acknowledge receipt of the budget impact schedule and thank the manager. Second. second. Moved and seconded. Everybody understand it? All in favor, raise your hand. All those opposed, to vote. Seven to nothing. Item 91, to consider a proposed roadway drainage improvement program for fiscal years 1991 to 1995 and taking necessary action. I believe the public works director is going to handle that, but he is ill tonight, so we'll have to let the manager do it. Uh, again, this is a, a report that is beginning to be an annual report, and it summarizes uh, recommendations for roadway and drainage needs over the next five years. I think probably the best news uh, for those that don't like traffic uh, lights uh, is that there, there is no traffic light proposed until at least fiscal year 1993, which is four years away. But I, I still caution everyone that the day is coming. Uh, but prior to that, 
I'm suggesting that uh, in this coming uh, year we have a traffic study uh, through the town center here extending from uh, uh, the intersection down here at what I call Pond Cove Corner uh, up around to near the intersection of Fowler Road and that could be done at a cost of about 4000 uh, that we complete uh, the bikeway over on Sawyer Road near the Rod and Gun Club at an expense of about 40000 that we uh, improve drainage on Waterhouse Road, uh, an area that's had some real problems that uh, also cost of 40000 that we begin a plan of uh, shore road shoulder improvements uh, uh, this year at an estimated cost of 50000 And that what that would uh, involve is uh, an additional two to four feet on each side of the road. Uh, it is not a bikeway, and very clearly uh, cannot be a bikeway with those uh, with those distances. But it does uh, give an, an additional measure of safety uh, for both pedestrians, uh, bicyclists, and particularly for the drivers that are already uh, utilizing uh, the road. Uh, finally, it, uh, the overlay uh, is proposed in there, and that it, it has in fact already been completed as a result of deliberations during the budget process in future years there's a number there are a number of other projects which I won't go over at the t this time you have it in front of you and if any members of the public uh, would like a copy of the report it is available uh, here at the town hall no funds are provided here for uh, a match for the overlay of route 77 some of you may have read the newspaper article this week and if in fact the state does not fund a reasonable portion of that project we would have to uh, Relook at the FY90 allocations and, and make room uh, for that. But at, as of this point, uh, we're still hoping that the state fulfills uh, its responsibility. So I would ask that you acknowledge your seat of the report and be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Anybody got a comment? Question? Yes, Council Cogs. I have a question on the um, Route 77 state overlay. Is that particular stretch that's being done inside or outside the urban compact zone? These signs indicate that it is outside the urban compact zone. So technically it shouldn't be of any expense to us. That is the opinion of the town council chairman, myself, and I'm sure most everyone else here. Anybody else? I move that we acknowledge receipt of the report on recommended roadway improvement. I'll second. Been moved and second. One comment before we vote. I noticed when I read this report and I didn't realize, does the state take care of all the two lights road? No. I didn't notice two lights road being involved here in the next few years, but there's one section of it on the upper end of it that is kind of rough. Okay, the, uh, the state that? portions they plan to do, I believe, this spring, uh, with the same time they're doing Sparrow Wink. And I, I say that, you know, they plan to do, they were, they were going to do it last fall, and it's, it's not done, but... Uh, our understanding is they're going to do it this spring. And the town will work cooperatively to fill in through its regular overlay program any little pieces that could got left out. We did do the bottom uh, down by Dyer Cove uh, this fall. Okay, everybody understand the motion? All in favor, raise your hand. Those opposed, so vote, seven and up. 10 o'clock, going well. What was that? We're getting there. Getting there. I like your agendas. Item 92, consider allocation of fiscal year 1990 funds in the roadway drainage improvement account and take the necessary action. What do you have on that one? Those were the items I just mentioned, the, uh, the shore road shoulder improvement program, the traffic study, the Sawyer Road bikeway and the Waterhouse Road drainage improvements. What I'd recommend is that you schedule a public hearing uh, on those allocations for your January 22nd meeting and we would send notices out uh, attempt to through uh, uh, of course a legal notice in the paper to inform the people on Waterhouse Road uh, that you're considering and inform the, the folks on Sawyer Road and uh, get the word out on uh, Shore Road. Anybody got a comment? Do we have a motion? Mr. So. Chairman, I move that we set for public hearing on January 22nd, 1990 at 730 at the Town Hall the proposed allocations for the recommended roadway improvements for fiscal year 1990. I'll second. second. Been moved and seconded. All in favor, raise your hand. Those opposed? Which way did you go? I was Seven to nothing. <laughs> 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 
to consider a report from the town manager recommending an increase in sewer rates and take in necessary action. I like this one. Yes, sir, Mr. Manager. This <coughs> yes. is your baby. Thank you, sir. This is probably the most unpleasant item uh, on tonight's agenda, even more unpleasant than wetlands and dogs and some of the other issues. Uh, we already have one of the higher sewer rates uh, in the area. Uh, what I'm asking tonight is to begin the process of the council considering a 7.2 percent increase. Uh, currently, our sewer budget is uh, around one uh, one million one hundred and twenty-three thousand dollars. Uh, the projection is for this coming year, the expenses are going to, get to go up to $1,196,570. Uh, the primary area of increase is in the Portland Water District assessment. Uh, it's actually going up a total of about $150,000 from last year. The increase is in the area of sludge disposal. Uh, they take the sludge from the Cape Elizabeth plant and bring it into Portland, and the expense for that has increased tremendously as well as the fact that they were taking quite a bit of money out of surplus before as a result of there was surplus generated the first year the plant was in operation because it started later than anticipated. That surplus is no longer available. Uh, this is, uh, interestingly enough, I think this is Cape Elizabeth is, is, is the first one out of the chute uh, on this issue. I'm speaking with water district uh, personnel, the, the assessment for the city of Portland is going up uh, approximately 30%. Uh, that percentage off the top of my head, but going up about $2 million. Uh, the same thing is happening in Westbrook and a number of other communities where their assessments are going up well into the, the double digits and their sewer rates will probably have to go up similarly. So while this 7.2% this is extremely difficult to stomach, I think when we look at it in comparison to the other communities, uh, we, we won't feel quite as bad as, as we do tonight. But anyway, I would ask that you refer this to the Board of Sewer Appeals. They do have a meeting scheduled for uh, early January, uh, and perhaps they can look at my recommendation, make some suggestions uh, as to either areas of savings or other ways of raising the revenue, uh, and uh, they, for them to report back to you in February, uh, so you can perhaps hold a public hearing in March. Anybody got a comment? Most distasteful. Thank you. Do I hear a motion? I would move that we send it to the uh, sewer, uh, the Board of Sewer Appeals for them to review and to get back to us by February 1st, 1990. Second. Been moved and second. I got one comment, and it's been my gripe for two or three years to them. Now don't turn your head. And <laughs> I have said, and I want to say again, that these people are on sewers, and I had supper with a family tonight, an uh, elderly couple, and they were telling me what their problems was as far as living in Cape Elizabeth, and one of them is a sewer deal. And I think it's something that we got to take a hard look at and find a way to generate some revenue. People don't like sewers. People don't, all they want is fill and grow. Stick the sludge and materials in the ground which I disagree when you have a facility there that I feel could take some more and that would generate some revenue so you wouldn't have to have this sewer increase. This is going to get serious to elderly people in the next few years whether some people like it or not and whether they want to uh, cut down on growth or what have you but you're better off to cluster some of your growth and put them on a sewer than stick them in every 80,000 square feet of Cape Elizabeth and have their own system. Thank you. And everyone understands the motion, and we'll so vote that this is referred to the Sewer Appeals Board for a review. All those in favor, raise your hand. Those opposed? It's a vote, seven to nothing. Item 94, to consider a proposed agreement with the Poland Water District to maintain a sewer pump station and take any necessary action. Mr. Manager. Yes, in June you approved the assumption of the maintenance of the pump stations by the Portland Water District. In your packet on Friday, you received a number of legal documents that would accomplish this change uh, as prepared by the town attorney. I would uh, ask that you authorize me to execute those agreements as prepared by the town attorney uh, on behalf of the town of Cape Elizabeth. I so move. Second. So I hear a second. All in favor, raise your hand. Those opposed? 
to vote. Yes. I just had a couple questions I wanted to ask Michael, that was all. <laughs> oh. <laughs> it's getting late, you gotta oh, move fast. I'm sorry, you wanna ask him now? I just wanted to know if other towns have turned over the same sort of yeah. thing to the Portland Water District. In fact, most of them have turned over the entire operation for the maintenance of all the lines as well. And we didn't do that? We, we've asked them for an estimate, but they haven't provided one. And, you know, at such time we receive it, we'll take a look at it, see if it's reasonable or not. Okay. Item 95, to consider a proposed deed with the Wildwood Condominium Association relating to the responsibility for the operation of Wildwood Pump Station in Force, Maine, extending from the pump station and take any necessary action. I believe that's the manager has that one. Yeah, this follows also in June, you, you accepted responsibility in, in concept uh, for this pump station, and I would ask that you authorize the acceptance of the easement deed uh, you uh, sign on to the agreement, you approve the agreement, as well as uh, I don't, you don't have to do anything with the bill of sale, I don't believe, no. But w what this does is uh, takes over formal responsibility for the pump station at Wildwood, as well as the force main leading from the pump station out to Route 77, so that all pump stations uh, would be uh, responsibly maintained and uh, regularly watched. Okay. Council Cogeshaw. Haven't we already turned this over to the Portland Water District? Are we getting? Yes, this is just cases? this is just the legal document that follows uh, okay. your your agreement in June. Anybody else? Do we hear a motion? I would move that we uh, transfer, uh, accept the deed and, and uh, of the Wildwood Pump Station. Do we hear a second? Second. second. Been moved and seconded. I have one question. Which way is that flowing at the present time? Southern, south or north? It is flowing <laughs> every time. Yes. It always comes up every time. Yes, at every meeting. And, it and it's always different. That's what I like. <laughs> no, 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 no. It continues to flow into the Southern Cape Elizabeth uh, wastewater treatment facility. Thank you. Oh. As it should. As it should. <laughs> but it, there's some sewage can go either way. Uh, everybody understand the motion? All in favor, raise your hand. Those opposed? It's a vote. Item 96, to consider a proposed lease with the United States Coast Guard for the Portland Headlight Keeper's Quarters and take any necessary action. I think Mike has a little background on that. Yes, this is a lease that would begin in 1990 and extend to the year 2020 or for a period of 30 years. Uh, no monetary rent would be paid. We could use the facility uh, for educational, historic, recreational, uh, and cultural programs open to and for the benefit of the general public. Theme displays, museum, transit guest rooms, gift shop, and open exhibits are authorized. Appropriate portions of the existing improvements may be utilized for living quarters if desirable for security purposes. In addition to that, there's a, uh, several pages of uh, special provisions uh, the wastewater system is currently being relicensed. We have very favorable response from the DEP that it looks like uh, this current sand filter system with the chlorinator uh, will, be, will be approved uh, into what are uh, waters that on one side of the lighthouse will be SB and on the other SC. Uh, there are no SA waters uh, there. Uh, we currently provide water to the site. Uh, any fees that we receive from the rental will have to be plowed back either into the property directly or to the related facilities such as the road going in the parking lot and uh, some of those some of those type things uh, improvements uh, in the area we're not allowed to make a profit uh, on it if we do charge a fee for admission members of the armed services uh, and retired members would have to be permitted free of charge yeah i'm getting free if you have your card you have to be a card carrying veteran uh, we continue to have to allow the Coast Guard access to the light tower and to the fog signal and the building adjacent to it. Uh, they can only, the lease can only be terminated from uh, the declaration of a national emergency by the President of the United States. Uh, and uh, if the, or if we didn't comply with the lease, uh, we could provide some notice. Uh, we have to comply with laws and there's certain provisions for the, the noise signal and different signage on that. 
there are still a number of items we're continuing to discuss with the Coast Guard, one of which is the transfer of $18,000 they have left uh, in a fund for the lighthouse uh, that could be used for exterior, and we're continuing to have other discussions that uh, hopefully uh, will we'll make the lease uh, more palatable. Very good. Anybody got a comment? Council Latore. On number four, I'm very surprised to read that if we charge any fees, any monies derived must go into the actual property itself regarding the maintenance, upkeep, preservation, security, or administration of the leased property. Because the potential there for it generating you know, a fairly substantial amount of revenue, should we even decide to go with a modest fee, could be a tremendous amount of money, which, which may in fact dwarf the possibilities of it simply being reinvested back onto that property. And I'm wondering if that is negotiable or if that could be such that we could put the money back into Fort Williams, if not including to keep the, the uh, tax rate down for the citizens of Cape Elizabeth. I mean, the same as, uh, for instance, in Scarborough, they charge $5 to get on the ferry beach. They're certainly free to use that revenue, however they deem fit within the town budget. I, I don't think we could reasonably, given what projected revenues could be for this, live with number four. This, this has been reviewed by the Coast Guard Real Estate Office in, I want to say, Governor's Island. And uh, it's very standard federal practice that uh, these leased properties, the, the entities are leased to are not to allow to make a profit. Uh, you know, I've spoken some with the council chairman on it, and he, he uh, I believe, is inclined to speak to others about that. I, I don't look at it so much as a profit. I, I look at profit in that sense as a public private sector word. I'm, I'm talking about we're a municipal entity, and it would be used to hold a tax rate down, so to speak. But certainly, to be able to have to plow all the money back into the physical structure itself. If, if, you know, I, I've heard estimates that as high as 500,000 people a year tour that property, you know, I, even at a dollar a head, you can quickly see what the projected potential revenues are here. I, I just cannot see us living within the confines of number four as this lease is, is, is put out. Now, if there's, you know, if it's something that we can negotiate with them with or they're not going to strictly enforce or whatever, but if that were strictly enforced, the way I envision a potential museum there, I just, I simply don't understand it. We're not even we're not even a nonprofit corporation. We're a municipal entity that would be, you know, using this money for purely municipal purposes. So that's quite restrictive. Yeah, I, I think your your projection of five hundred thousand is is excessively high. Uh, we, we're no, no, I, I just all I mentioned was that was a number that was given to me by a Coast Guard official as to how many people passed through the property last year. Now, what percentage of them would go to a museum and pay a dollar? I don't know. Mm -hmm. What if it was two dollars? Would two hundred fifty thousand of them go through the museum? I don't know. I'm just simply I'm just stating the principle, okay. um, which which absolutely uh, amazed me that that was that that's in. The I'll, I'm not recommending you take final action from the lease tonight. I'll take that comment uh, back to the Coast Guard. Thank you. Anybody else? Yeah, I'd, I'd like uh, to have some clarification on what would happen if at some future time we charge for admission into the fort. Would all of those fees have to? No. Well, I wonder. You know, I, I think we ought to have. Uh, we can get that spelled out. Because that's not the problem. And the other thing is the 30 year lease. I just have a real problem with that shorter term lease if we're going to be investing town monies into this facility. I think we'll be working on that. I hate to make any comments at this point. No, I have it. Council Cargishaw. I want to reaffirm Jane's concern about the 30-year lease. I think that's far too minimal. And also, as far as um, any revenues that have been generated, um, having to be put back into the actual lighthouse area. In order to reach that lighthouse, you need to travel through the main entry road, and I would think that would be appropriate to be able to use some of those funds to help maintain that road. Nothing else in the fort. Yeah, you know, no question on, uh, you know, I think it's, it follows Frank Latore's comments, Council Latore's, uh, you know, restroom facilities that would be off-site, the road, parking, um, where picnic impact. tables, wear and tear. The lighthouse is the attraction, and uh, it brings in the traffic, and if there's revenues that, that uh, wear and tear that's coming in as a result of that, it ought to be plowed back in 
we ought to push that forward. I think it's very critical for us to be very far-sighted on this, not short-sighted on this. That's right. The potential there is absolutely incredible, and I, I, I will just keep pushing that from now until I leave the council many years hence. But uh, <laughs> nonetheless, no, nonetheless seriously, seriously, it's, the potential there is, is great, and we have to be very leery of what's implicated in number four. That's right. I think it's just got to be uh, spelled out a little bit, uh, broadened a little bit, and I think it could be done because, as Council Cargashaw just mentioned there, the, there's other areas in the fort that will affect the uh, museum at the lighthouse. Council Matheson. Um, Mr. Chairman, uh, on the first page of this packet, there is a legal description of the boundaries of the Lighthouse? Hmm. Well, no. Is, is this the boundaries of the property that the um, that the keeper's house is in? This this what has been reviewed is, by the town attorney, and this is actually uh, everything that was not conveyed to the town on December first of 1964. That is out on that point. Uh, then the Coast Guard reserves the right in this to still go to the tower and the other facilities. Say again. They they reserve the they, they still own the other properties. The lighthouse. The lighthouse itself. and the fog, the, the whistle. And the fog more. But it, it's the lease. The, all of the property is being leased to us, but they maintain the rights to to maintain and do do the the other whistle house whatever. It Including is. the land that the lighthouse itself is on. Including the land that the t light tower is on. Yes, but this this uh, here is the area around that whole building, and including the light, the whistle, everything. room, and everything. Yeah. And then they just ended up with a right to go there to maintain that. That's right. right. And they have to maintain the outside as well as the inside. Is that correct? That's correct. Of those buildings. That's correct. Okay, Council Greenlaw. I thought you had your hand I up. I do. I did. Okay. Under the special provisions number four. Number six, I'm sorry. In the sixth line down, there's the active aids to navigation. It states that the government reserves the right to relocate, replace, or add any aids or make any changes. I would feel more, much more comfortable if there were going to be prior notice to the town about anything like that taking place. Good, good point. Yeah, and I, I think that some very valid concerns have been brought up already, and those are all concerns that I would like to add my voice to. Council Cargoshaw. We had hoped um, initially to be able to actually own the lighthouse and the property it was on instead of just leasing it, it eventually would be turned over to us. But if we're getting a deed now that includes the land under the lighthouse itself, that may not... We're only getting a lease. We're only getting a lease now, but we had hoped to ultimately own the lighthouse and the land it is on. But right now, the lease is including the land under the lighthouse. Is that typical of the way they 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 keep the actual property, but they're leasing we're leasing the land back to them, or they're leasing the land to us? That, that's this is the standard practice, but there there are avenues <coughs> to discuss that with the government. I'd like to <coughs> like to have you pursue that so that um, that we're really just leasing our own land that we're going to be using and not the edge of the cliff, too. Councilor Tory. Uh, should we pursue avenues uh, of, of the government for further discussion before we actually sign a lease? Or should we sign a lease and then pursue avenues within the government for further discussion? I'm not real sure of the timing on that. In other words, because we may have this as a draft lease, come back another lease. Do we want to sign it or do we want to have negotiations ongoing rather than commit to signing something and then having to renegotiate it. I think we would have some ongoing, ongoing discussion before, before we, had to we do actually a sign the lease. Okay. That's good. I would like to say my only concern on that, and I, I, you know, I agree with the council chairman that it needs to be ongoing. Uh, we're currently going through an RFP process for architects. Uh, we, we, we currently have access to the premises. Uh, you know, at, at some point before we sign any contracts with any architects, uh, we've got to make we've got to have the, the premises in hand, either by lease or otherwise. And uh, you know, if if it 
if it drags on the other discussions which could begin, uh, that delays the whole process of, of doing anything and le leaves the building uh, vacant and subject to what happens with vacant buildings. Yep. We don't have to sign this tonight. Though. No, we don't. No. no. Okay. All right. I think by the next council meeting or something. That's what I'm getting yeah. at, though. By the, next, by the next council meeting, us signing a 30-year lease with caveats that maybe this could happen or that might happen down the line is, is a different ballgame than a 99-year lease or m me seeing a clear avenue towards ownership, which I think maybe was I derived somehow out of earlier statements that had happened here. You know, so I, I need to be able to see what road, before I could ever acknowledge to uh, uh, sign on to a 30-year lease, see what roads I can pursue to get to a 99-year lease or preferably outright ownership. Well, I've had discussions with the council chairman and he is pursuing those options and using, you know, the authority. The, mm -hmm. You know, the council chairman sometimes has a little more influence than a manager. Mm -hmm. and, uh, he's he does? Been, he's been hard working on that. Okay. Okay. I, I didn't wear that one right. You did. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> didn't bother me a bit. Okay. The, the, the other thing I would say, if, excuse me, Mr. Go Chairman, ahead. I would, if you would let me. Sure. Uh, you know, there, there are certain, you know, in ongoing negotiations on property, uh, you know, sometimes public disclosure uh, can be harmful to the position of the community. And, uh, you know, there, there are some ongoing discussions, and I think that the public comments tonight were extremely helpful. But, you know, I want to assure you that the others that are ongoing are well, are exactly within what is being discussed. Mm -hmm. Okay. Does anybody want to make a motion? I move to acknowledge receipt of the draft lease as presented to us. Second. Been moved and seconded. Any other comment? All those in favor, raise your hand. Those opposed? It's a vote, seven to nothing. Item 97, to consider authorizing a grant application to the Maine Historical Preservation Commission for the replacement of siding at Portland Headlight and take any necessary action. I'll turn that over to the manager because he's been reviewing that. This is something that uh, we'd like to work with the current owner of the property on uh, to ensure that we meet that an application deadline is met uh, for uh, ex exterior renovations. Uh, specifically, we received a report on needs of the building, and one of them is uh, the fact that the aluminum siding on the building is corroding. It's, aluminum siding is inappropriate to begin with, and the aluminum siding that, that is there is in terrible shape. Uh, it's a project the Coast Guard would like to work with us on, and we can use their funds to be matched by uh, the Lighthouse Preservation Fund that George Mitchell and Senator Regal and a few others helped establish a few years ago. So I would Not ask that you... They have federal funds, but it, you apply to the Maine Historic Preservation yeah. Commission. Yeah. Anybody got any comment? Yes, sir. Council Creamer. Yes, sir. <clears throat> I'm a little confused about uh, making application for that grant in the context of um, uh, ownership. Could you expand upon this? Uh, confusion? Yeah, that's why in my comments I emphasize working with the Coast Guard. What we would, in, we would in essence, be saying to them. Uh, we'll, we'll do the necessary work to prepare the grant application. If it's necessary that the Coast Guard name be at the bottom of it, you would be actually signing it. But we're, in <coughs> fact, telling the Coast Guard that if they got 18 grand left, that we want uh, about 15 of it uh, to go towards this project because it's an important priority for us. Uh, and if, as we looked at, Henry and I looked at all the different priorities, we felt that, that this is, is the most important because of the ongoing deterioration of the wood underneath the siding. Uh, in, in addition to the, the poor condition of the siding itself. If you look at it closely, it's all bubbly and, and it's in tough shape. So as I understand it, you've got to be ongoing with the Coast Guard in order to get the funds to match this. Yeah, and federal funds can match federal funds. Uh, Henry, check that out with the uh, Maine Historic Preservation Commission. Okay. So, Michael, yes. is what you're saying, to get to, to, get to the... Uh, federal funds that we have some potential for getting through. It has to go through the Maine Historical yep. Society. That, that's that's, the way, that's going to be our conduit. Yes, and, and Henry Adams, Adams, the project coordinator, has had some good discussions with them, and they would welcome an application okay. for our front. Okay. okay, no other comment? Do I hear a motion? I move to authorize the uh, town manager to submit a grant <clears throat> application regarding the lighthouse uh, 
period. Do we hear a second? Second. Do we want to understand the motion? All in favor, raise your hand. Those opposed? It's a vote. Seven to nothing. Gee, moving right along. 10, 30, two, four, five more items. Item 99, to consider a grant Granting a quick claim deed to chat. Oh, I skipped one. I'm sorry, I will back up one. To consider authorizing a grant application to the Municipal Legal Defense Fund for the Davis Wetlands case and taking necessary action. I believe you all read in your packet a memo from the manager, which he thought it would be worth a try. Worth a try, okay. Worth a try to apply for some reimbursement to the town for the uh, Davis wetland case. And I'll have the manager elaborate more on that. Yeah, the under the Growth Management Act, the state set up a, a fund that communities can apply for uh, assistance with legal cases that, that they feel are worthy, have statewide significance. And uh, we, have an, a, we have a feeling that, that this is one that we could make an argument has statewide significance in that uh, well, I don't want to go in, I don't want to rehash the case, uh, but you know, as as was described at the last meeting, uh, it has in order to file the application it has to be within so many days of when the decision was rendered. We're beginning to get close to that, so what I'd like to do is give the town attorney a call and find out the total that we expended <coughs> for this case, and to apply for the maximum amount uh, that we can. Council Cargoshell. Yes, I'm just going to move the question. Second. Been moved and second. I notice in reading your memo that it says reasonable attorney fees. You'll get them out of the attorney. I will get. <laughs> our our town attorney does charge a fee that uh, is uh, less than most municipal attorneys do. So I'm sure there won't be any problem with the uh, reasonableness of the okay. fees. Thank you. You all understand the motion? All in favor, raise your hand. Those opposed? That's a vote. I'm now I'll move on to 99. To consider granting a quick claim deed to Charles S. and Sandra L. Fowler for land and buildings situated at 9 Waterhouse Road and take any necessary action. The manager has that one. Yeah, in order to make the discussion briefer, this one as well as the next item uh, were both res as a result of us sending additional 30 day notices of foreclosure. Uh, and I would encourage, uh, and fortunately, both property owners step forward, and I'd encourage you to uh, adopt each, or authorize me to. Uh, actually, the motion is to authorize the manager to exec execute the quick claim on behalf of the so municipality. Second. Been moved and seconded. All in favor, raise your hand. Those opposed? It's a vote, seven to nothing. Item 100, to consider granting a quick claim deed to H. Baldwin, Hoffman for land and buildings situated on 8 Elmwood Road and taking necessary action. I believe this could be spelled out or explained approximately the same way as a previous item. Exactly. Move acceptance of the quick claim deed. Second. second. Been moved and seconded. All in favor, raise your hand. Those opposed? <laughs> item 101. <coughs> to consider granting a quick claim deed to Paul G. and Karen A. Stewart for land and buildings on at Mine Away, Man Away, excuse me, and take any necessary action. The manager, would you like to comment? One way here, fourth or the other. Yes, I'd, I'd be happy to. Uh, this particular item, I've explained it previously to the council in executive session as well as, I, I don't know if the town attorney was ever present as well, but you certainly had an opinion from the town attorney. Uh, I, I don't really want to bore the council with the details, but I think it's only fair that uh, we relate to the public uh, exactly the status of this, and if you'll bear with me for rehashing it. Uh, back in 1985, I believe it was, the state changed the format uh, that had to go on notices when you send out a notice of foreclosure when you're about to take over property. Uh, unfortunately, the town did not change uh, from the old form to the new form. Uh, an attorney for the Stewarts raised the issue of whether or not we had legitimately foreclosed on this property because of the failure to use the appropriate notice. 
Uh, the courts in, in the past have, have ruled that we must follow the letter of the law in all instances relating to property foreclosures. Uh, the particular notices that were left off, it was, the notice was sent, uh, but the particular section was left off as kind of a, a consumer protection notice in big letters that said something to the effect, this means you will lose your property, so that there could be no doubt at all what the notices meant. Unfortunately, when the law was changed and that consumer notice was required, as I, as I mentioned, we didn't put it on. Uh, we could have gone on, uh, you know, playing a cat and mouse game uh, with the Stewarts as to whether or not, you know, our position, our notice was legal or whether or not it wasn't. We, we, we haven't really taken a position on that. The town attorney has. Uh, but, you know, while that was ongoing, meanwhile, the property would have continued to to lay uh, unimproved and per perhaps a hazard to the neighborhood. Uh, if we wanted to go through the unsafe structure uh, st uh, procedure or the dangerous uh, buildings procedure of the state statutes, we were in a difficult position because if we were alleging that we owned the property and we sent the notice to the town uh, you know, to fix it up, then they would come back at us and say, you didn't uh, own it, you took improper action. And it, it was a, just a an impossible situation to be in. So, uh, you know, it's, it was my feeling, uh, as well as the town attorney's, that perhaps the best bet would be to uh, allow the stewards an opportunity to remit all the taxes that were owed, which consist of about $5,000. Uh, they have done so uh, through the attorneys. We, we actually don't have it in-house, but it is through the attorneys. Uh, Tom Lee, he's, uh, has secured it. And uh, to grant the quit claim. Uh, with the understanding, uh, or, or not so much an understanding, but with my feeling is that from here, hopefully you would authorize this quit claim, and then we would give Mr. Stewart uh, administratively a period of time to correct uh, the unsafe deficiencies in the property uh, without, without forcibly going through the unsafe structure provision, so that, you know, just like we do with everyone else, we first take, come on, fix up your building. Uh, but if, if there is no reaction to that uh, within a very short period of time, uh, perhaps at next month's meeting, uh, if nothing is done, that we then recommend a public hearing uh, on uh, the unsafe structure, within the unsafe stru structure uh, provisions of the law, similarly as we did on the one spur and cabinet property. So that's essentially where it stands, and uh, this would uh, give Mr. Stewart control of the property and would put him in a position that he, if he was so chose he and he and Mrs. Stewart, they could uh, make improvements to the, the property, would get it out of the limbo that it's now in. Okay, mm -hmm. everybody understand it? Council Amro. I'd like to be asked, I'd like to ask <laughs> <laughs> to be excused from uh, participating in this item because of a possible call. What's your wishes? That's Everyone fine. says yes. Council Cargasol. Same for me, please. Same from you. Conflicts. Conflicts. Okay, possible conflicts. Possible. We'll put I have uh, just one to make sure everybody understands. This would go within a month or so under the same procedure as one spunk animal. That is the proper route. Is that correct? What, what if I, they don't? Yeah, well, first, administratively, we, we will see if we can get it going uh, without the... See, the problem with the unsafe structures and the town has to move in and get the work done, and it's, it gets messy. Right. And it, it's much better if we can get him to do it himself. Okay, but just wondering how much time we'd take to do it, but it's okay. I will work with uh, the building inspector on it. So item 101, what's your wishes? Mr. Chairman, I move that we authorize the manager to sign a quick claim deed for this property. Second. Moved and seconded. All those in favor, raise your hand. Those opposed, we have it. Five to two, with two abstain. Okay. Now I believe from Councilor Greenlaw that we do have an item to bring up out of order. And then it is at 11 o'clock, we'll so let you do this. I appreciate that, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to introduce, and I'm not sure if I do this the right way. But You'll do it. it. Item 102, out of order. Um, this is being requested to fill the Municipal Facilities Committee. We have an application from Thomas Emery to serve in that committee. I would like to pour, put forth his name to do so. Second. Ever, 
Everyone uh, on a move that we bring an item up out of order, item 102. All in favor, raise your hand. And now the item pertains to filling the vacancy of the municipal committee, and you have a name. Do I hear a motion now? I'd like to move that Thomas Emery be appointed as a member of the Municipal Facilities Committee. Second. Been moved and second. All in favor, raise your hand. Those opposed? I see some sleepy eyes here, so we won't take okay? <laughs> too much don't more look time in that direction, on Mr. Yeah. Chairman. I'm ready to invite you to even more meetings. Just, just a minute. Just a, don't get nervous now. <laughs> citizens discussion. Items not on the agenda. I don't see too many citizens here, but I would like to ask the camera people out there. Previously, there's always a little note here to say when these I'd, uh, meetings are going to be seen on TV again. Some people might like to see the last part because they get tired at the first part. Does anybody have any idea when these will be reviewed or should I announce it or shouldn't I announce it? Mr. Chairman, I'd like to make one other comment before we adjourn, if I could. December 14th and 15th. December 14th and 15th, do you have the time? Noon and 4 and 6.30. 7.30, sorry. Okay, I think that covers it. Yes, Councilor Tory. I'd like to uh, ask the town manager, what, what is our vehicle for input regarding the cable increase that is gonna be hitting our community? Is there a way that we, could, that we participate in that process? I know Portland is participating in it. Do we? Do we simply have to accept the increase and there is no administrative or legislative process that we can have to have input into this process? The Cable Television Communications Act of whatever year it was a few years ago and an act of Congress uh, took away municipal right of rate, rate regulation. Uh, cable systems all over the, comp all over the country are uh, squeezing more money out of their customers, uh, to put it nicely. Uh, there is a movement afoot in Congress, uh, I believe there's going to be hearing sometime in the next five, five months, six months, uh, to re-regulate the cable industry. Uh, you know, really, you, the, if you want to get some control, it's one of two things, either uh, approach your, your congressional delegation or secondly, to pull the plug. Well, I'd, I'd like to, I'd like to ask you, I'd like to ask you to provide me some backup material, if you could, on just, just to go through our files and get me all the correspondence that you have as it goes back to a couple of years ago when we talked about them pulling Channel 56. And remember, remember the exchange of letters and communications that we had, that they would pull Channel 56 in exchange for the 10 o'clock news being on the air seven nights a week, which would then continue to give us access to that type of news program. That show is now down to three or four nights a week. It certainly has been taken off of Saturday nights. It's been taken off of Sunday nights. So I, I remember some co a covenant between us and, and cable regarding this whole issue. And I, I just would like to refresh my memories. So I'm asking if you could please send me what you might have in your file regarding all the correspondence that, that, that transacted at that time. Would you? It's about the eight tech. Usually the policy is that when we provide it to one council, we provide it to all. Would it be possible instead you could just look at the file sometime? Okay. Is it that thick? I don't, I don't think there well, were that many letters. Yeah, it's, it's up there. Okay. Because... Uh, I'm trying to reduce the thickness of the packets makes sense. Good that, idea. That program, which was guaranteed to us to remain on the air, is no longer on the air. I think and it's I, on more than you think. No, it isn't. No, it isn't. It's on before and after. Game. It's been, see, the more Fox is growing now in Channel 51, Fox is getting stronger and stronger, and, Channel, and the News at 10 is being the victim of Fox's strength. So you, you'd be surprised how infrequently it's on. There's also, a, excuse me, there's a, there's, a, there's a new law coming into effect soon that, for example, MASH and all those programs, uh, if those are on a station in the local market, they can ask another market coming in from out of town to uh, black those out. Mm -hmm. So what's going to happen is Channel 56 is going to be blacked out 50% of the time. There is no Channel 56 anymore. 56 well, is gone. Whatever the 
the, the news at 10 station, whatever it is. That's that's 56, but see, okay. PA, w, 51, yeah. channel 51 has picked up that station. That, right. that was what they made as a deal yeah. to us in exchange for us not pressing the fact that 56 went off the okay. air. But They're not living up to their agreement. Yeah, what I think I was going to say is it's only going to get worse. And uh, can you know, we, consumer, can consumer pressure ought to come on. Uh, I'm, well, I'm going to start a movement for consumer pressure, but I want to get all of my facts together. For can we uh, discuss that later and let these sleepy eyes well, it's, it's people go home? It's of interest to people at home. Oh, it is? Yes. Uh, I'd like to know how many's awake at this time. time to I move we adjourn. Pretty bad. I'll second. I had a comment that I wanted to thank all you people for such a long meeting this afternoon, this evening, and the cameramen for staying in. Possibly the people uh, at home are still with us, but I would like to have you counselors think about whether we should have two meetings a month, because I believe this is the longest agenda that we've had for some years now. And maybe we, you don't mind this, you like this. But Mr. Chairman, to show me to show the respect I have for you as chairman, I think we should have two meetings in January. We have two meetings right. lined up. Oh. <laughs> I was trying to make it look better. All in favor say aye in a Jenny. Aye. Thank you. Thank you all. Good Thank night. You all. I'm always the last to know. About not being properly notified. The policeman keeps dropping those packets, Jenny. You have to talk to him. Okay. Thank you. Give you my original dog ordinance.